to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 um, we've been in this verse for two sessions, and um, uh, likely we won't finish this verse tonight. But we'll read uh, verses 22 to 26. You can remain seated and follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, uh, temperance, which is self-control, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your Word. We pray, Father, that your Word would rule over our hearts, that we would submit to your authority be obedient to your word, and be hungry and thirsty for that which you would feed us with tonight. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Uh, we've been talking about um, the contrast as we've been going along, and the first word of verse 22, but provides that contrast from the works of the flesh, um, which you see in verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and we're talking about the fruit of the spirit, versus, if you will, the lust of the flesh. So uh, we see, saw the, the things that are produced by the lust of the flesh, not all of them, because in verse 21, it also says, and the like, at the end of that list. So uh, there are many, many other things that aren't included there, those which are fleshly or carnal in nature that we engage in um, as believers. Uh, and we do have a tendency to do that because we're not perfect. Now, um, we go to uh, verse 22 and it says, but. So contrasted with those uh, works of the flesh, if you will, we have in, uh, in direct uh, opposition to that, the fruit of the Spirit. And again, it's the, um, it's the invisible power of the Holy Spirit that works within us inwardly to produce a virtuous uh, and Christ-like character in our life uh, that, uh, that portrays all the virtues and aspects and characteristics of God. That's literally what is going on here. And uh, the Lord has chosen to give us in His Word uh, a detailed listing of those things. Um, and uh, it's probably suggested uh, at the end of verse 23, we don't plan to get there tonight, we'll talk more about that, but uh, where it says at the end of this list, against such there is no law. Um, so there's, there's nothing that prohibits us from exercising uh, these graces or virtues of God. There's nothing that prohibits us from doing that, except our, our tendency to act carnal sometimes, or to think carnally sometimes, uh, which is what believers do. But obviously, as we examine the spirits, as we studied recently in 1 John chapter 4, we're to try the spirits to see whether or not the spirit confesses, the spirit of an individual, that is, confesses Jesus Christ. And one that doesn't, that is one that doesn't uh, uh, is not characterized, a person is not characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, obviously is a person who's not of the Spirit, not walking in the Spirit, doesn't possess the Holy Spirit uh, as a gift that God gives when we put our faith in Christ and He saves us by His grace, His amazing grace. Amen. So um, we've already talked about love and joy and peace, and last week we studied long-suffering uh, which is um, uh, which is patience. So last week we talked about that, uh, the ability to endure, if you will, all kinds of circumstances and situations. 
because this peace of God that we see in here, that we, that we studied just before that, our joy and our peace, if you will, uh, are irrespective of what transpires in our life. Whatever transpires, our joy and our peace are stay the same. And uh, the clear indication is that our, our patience should also be the same, regardless of our circumstances. And we have a tendency to get impatient, don't we? Um, when, when things aren't going our way, uh, we have a tendency to get a little aggravated. Uh, and we talked last week about what we tend to do in those circumstances is, you know, sort of complain a little bit. And the Lord doesn't like complaining at all. Um, you know, Mary and I were, were just this morning, we spent some time just discussing complaining uh, and uh, because it was a, we, we mentioned here last week, but uh, it's that which characterized the, Isra the Israelites, the, the, the children of Israel, children of God, uh, when they went through uh, the 40 years of wandering. The reason they did that was because of, they didn't, they didn't have trust in what God's plan was, that it was actually a good plan. And the more they saw, the more they were convinced it wasn't. And, uh, but we need patience. Now keep in mind this. So all those people in the, in the provocation is called, all of the people that were over 20 were not allowed to go into the promised land at the, the time of provocation. The time that they said, you know, the 10 spies came back and said, it's not what God said it was. Two came back and said, hey, piece of cake, we got this thing. Not because of what they saw, but because of what God told them. That, they could, that was their promised land for them to take. So the people followed the leaders and those 10 leaders and everybody over 20, except for Joshua and Caleb, because they were the two good spies that believed God, despite all odds apparently against them, what they could see visually. Uh, but all of those over 20 also were not allowed to go to the promised land. The ones that were allowed to go to the promised land uh, were those that were 20 and under. Um, we were talking about that today, and I reflected a little bit. I told Mary, I said, you know, I said, um, uh, when we got married, um, actually, my mother took me to court, sued me when I was uh, 16 years, 17 years old. She sued me and took everything I had from me because <laughs> I had just moved out of the house a couple of months prior. She didn't like the fact that I was doing better without her. So it's a long story. But she sued me, took me to court, and it was then that I found out that when you're, I was only 17, when you're under the age of 21, uh, you're still a child. You're still an infant, in fact. The, the law read, you're still an infant according to the law, which means you were totally under your parents' care. You had no rights, no privileges, nothing to do. And I found that out the hard way. Uh, but also when we went to get married, I found out that later, I found out that if you're under 21 at that time in Virginia, you had to get parental permission in order to marry because you're still an infant. So I learned that, and so I've oftentimes said, just as a sideline to the study, that the, the age of accountability, everybody asks, what age are people accountable? There's only one indication in Scripture of the age, and that's it, is the people that were over 20 weren't allowed to go. That is, the people that were 21 and older, they weren't allowed to go to the promised land. Those that were under, 20 and under, they weren't accountable God allowed them to go to the promised land. So um, sort of gives us some indication because we're quick to jump and give people rights. You know, now, you know, it used to be you had to be 21 to a lot of things. And they lowered it to, uh, to, to 18 and now 17 and getting lower and lower. And now they allow girls to go and have an abortion without the parents even knowing about it at any age just about. Um, so we've really degraded as a society, and I really believe the age of 21, and I've always thought this, is, is from the scriptures, from, from that passage, uh, our forefathers founded this nation uh, uh, as a Christian nation, if you will, but, and the Constitution reflects much of that. And what we see, though, is, um, is today we have changed a lot of things, and that's one basic principle that is, is underlying factor of a lot of decisions are made in our society. But um, what happened is these people complained a lot. They weren't allowed to go to 
the promised land. They just kept complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. For 40 years they complained. Even though their shoes never wore out, the clothes never wore out, they never went a day without food. They had something to drink, even though the water may have come out of a rock and the bread came from heaven. God provided for them. And they still complained. And, you know, the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And all these things are the water from the rock and the manna from heaven. That's what God has has promised to us, and he would care for us. Now, all, anything other than the food and the water, the provi necessary provisions of life, are just add-ons. And when we don't have those things, we start complaining. So we got less than somebody else, and we get envious, we get jealous. And all of these things creep in there. Uh, so last week we talked about patience, and I didn't get to that particular point, but regardless of our circumstances, we need to be patient. And through all of that, there were two patient people for sure, and that was Caleb and Jacob and um, Joshua. They were, they were patient. They were, they were looking forward to the day when they could take the promised land because they believed God had that for them. But yet, what did they have to do? They had to walk in the wilderness 40 years with all the rest of the people. Why? Because they were impatient. And, you know, and of course... After God held them accountable and said, you're not going to go, you're going to wander in the wilderness, then they pitched a fit. Oh, they want to change your mind then. Too late. Can't complain and then say you're sorry about complaining. You're just sorry you got caught complaining, right? So patience is indeed a virtue of every believer. should be because it is, it is an inwrought, inwrought uh, work that is involved in our relationship to God that he gives us this patience, and we need to be patient with God. We need to be patient with him. You know, our prayer requests oftentimes reflect our impatience. Uh, sometimes we pray, and 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 we just don't stop praying. I understand perseverance and persistence in prayer, but sometimes, uh, you know, Paul said, I prayed three times for this thorn in the flesh, and I gave up on it. And... Um, you know, sometimes I believe that we persist too long in something because we're, not, because we're not accepting the fact that it's not God's will for it to be done the way we want. And so we just keep asking for it, and one day we think that we're finally going to get it. Um, well, the Israelites did that, and they got Saul as a king. So we've got to be careful uh, what we pray for. We might actually get it. So, enough about... Um, Patience, if you will, or it's called long-suffering in the Scripture here. But the next one of the uh, characteristics that's described here, what every believer should demonstrate in their life, uh, is gentleness. Now, the word gentleness means kindness. It's kindness. Um, and again, um, we, we started uh, the first three, the, um, the love, joy, and peace, were our was our relationship with God. That's what God gives to us. And our expression of that is that really our appreciation, gratitude, and thanksgiving to God for having provided those things and to give us those things that transcend all of the circumstances in our life. Then we started with um, patience as that which is um, an aspect of our relationship with others, if you will, in, involved in our relationship with them. So, um, so the long-suffering or patience is not only patience uh, in, a, in our expectations from God but, and, and in the promises from God, but also, and perhaps more so, our relationships with others. So gentleness, if you will, is one of those, and it simply is being kind one to another. It's actually a good word for it, a good phrase for it is tender concern for others. And... Um, it's treating others gently, if you will, is why it's called here uh, gentleness. Treating others gently. It's a kindness of the, of the spirit that it, God gives to us. Um, so God gives us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, and with the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have every enablement to accomplish all of these. So being kind is not due to our deciding to do it, it's based on the, the, the might and the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit who resides within us, because Christ and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. Uh, Christ gave us the Holy Spirit. He's another comforter, and they both dwell in us. 
And we have the ability, there's nothing within us um, that, that disables us from demonstrating each of these uh, virtues, if you will. So gentleness is the one that we certainly need to be um, engaged in as fully as any of the rest of these. Now, in order to look at this a little closer, because for each one I do like to just get a little, little detail from other parts of Scripture. And we could go to a lot of parts of Scripture, but I want to look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. The most difficult part many times uh, in putting a message together is we can't spend all day. I'll probably spend a longer time than a lot of preachers do. But we can't spend uh, all day, although in our private study we can do that. And I challenge every person in here to do that. We all need to spend time in the Word. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's when you know you love studying the Word. When you study a study, you know, you're just engaged in studying. And, you're, and then all of a sudden you look up and it's been two or two and a half hours. And it's like, wow, time's really flying. Because, you know, otherwise it's like, okay, I'm going to put 30 minutes in it. You put out 30 minutes in it. Let me go have fun for two hours. And, you know, it's like, where are our priorities? Sometimes we get them mixed up. But let's take a look at this thing of kindness, if you will. And we'll find some other things related to it here as well. But in Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 28. Um, and it says, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls for my... Um, Yoke is easy, and thy burden is light. So this is the kindness of God towards us. This is an example of kindness. Um, Christ uh, is our strength. We understand that. The enablement to demonstrate and manifest this grace, this virtue of kindness, is given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so a couple of things here. Christ says, come unto me. Come by faith, right? Because nobody comes to the Lord Jesus Christ except by faith. So we have to come by faith. And our faith causes us to hunger and thirst for His Word. And when we do that, then we're going um, we're gonna to enjoy the purity that God gives to us, uh, confessing our sins that we commit after the time of salvation, and continuing to seek obedient life uh, and remain firm on God's Word. So that's all involved here with, Come unto me, all ye that labor... All ye that labor. Um, <laughs> now these are, it says, come to me ye that labor. So the invitation is to those who don't know Christ as Savior. Come unto me, uh, all ye that labor. Um, and I, the way I like to, to, to characterize labor, um, because when we were lost and um, and, and establishing our own self-righteousness, this is really the impossibility of self-righteousness. It's the impossibility of that. And, I, and, I, I, and I, I'm particularly uh, focused on that because that's, I know that's what God convicted me of as I was trying to establish my own righteousness. And it was actually impossible to do that. And I finally heard that from God's Word. And it sunk me in my spirit, and then it raised me up because God saved me from that sin and from all of my sins. Um, but come unto me, ye that are, ye, um, yeah, and, and learn of me, excuse me, back verse 28, all ye that labor, and this is that impossibility of, um, I call it self-righteous life, uh, because it's work, and are heavy laden, uh, you know, burdened down with, the, with sin and its consequences, because there are consequences to sin. We all know that. Uh, the lost have to suffer consequences daily for the sins in their life, and we were part of that. And life is difficult at best. And so we, we understand that there was a heavy burden upon us, and what does God do? God lifts that burden by, by delivering us from the bondage to sin, if you will, we labored so hard in order to, to establish our own righteousness. And what does it say? And I will give you, I will give you um, rest. Now this rest um, is a gift. He says, I will give you rest. Rest is a gift of God. Rest is not something we accomplish. 
It's not we put in our 40 hours in a week and now we're going to rest. We earned it. No, the rest is you get seven days a week because God gave it to you when he relieved you of your burdens. And now that's why he goes on to say, he says, for my yoke is easy, if you will, uh, in verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because we, we are not doing uh, this, this thing on our own. When we're saved by the grace of God, uh, we've given our life over to Him, and we're trusting God, and God enables us to do everything. He leads us, He guides us, He strengthens us. Paul said, even when I'm at a weakest point, Christ strengthens me. So we understand that there's no inadequacy, there's no insufficiency, uh, there's no shortcomings in a life of a believer only that we but impose upon ourselves certainly doesn't come from the Lord himself. But he says, take my yoke upon you in verse 29. And of course, this yoke is being yoked together with Christ. And when we do that, it's the cross that we bear. It's, it's taking the gospel wherever we go and talking to people and witnessing and living a life of obedience to the Lord. Uh, so that, for instance, an, a good example is in our family, uh, we're... Lord said, I didn't come to bring peace in the family, but set family members at variance with one another. Well, you know, that would be a difficult thing, but we can do that easily. It's easy and light because it's not us doing it. We're the messengers, right? But that's the right thing to do. And we don't mind doing the right thing and causing trouble in the family because we know that is going to be a product if other people aren't saved in our family. It's going to be a byproduct. And for us to try to try to not cause that division or that resistance or that opposition or that uneasy feeling in our family, we'd have to compromise the gospel. So we don't do that. So it's light and it's easy. Serving the Lord should be that way. I understand that there are circumstances where we're opposed by either family members or enemies of, of any kind. And when we are, uh, they don't hate us. They hate the one we serve. So it's really not that big of a deal with regards to our relationship with God because he is an our enabler, if you will. And he says here, and I want to talk, and this when we get to the gentle, uh, the kindness part of it, he says, for I am uh, meek and lowly in heart. I am meek and lowly in heart. And you know, he came uh, and was obedient to the Father, even unto death, which is where we should be. Even if we die, like Stephen the martyr, even if we die serving the Lord, so be it. Paul said, I'd rather be with the Lord because, uh, you know, than to be here dealing with these Corinthians. You know, that's what basically the essence of what he said. But no, the Lord had a task for him to do and he was doing it. But, but you have to be meek to do that. You have to be meek. You have to be lowly and humble. Um, and lowly in heart, if you will, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Now, um, this is what Christ offered to us. This is, these are words quoted by the Apostle Matthew um, as he gives to us the perspective of Christ himself regarding the invitation to come and the life we should live having received Christ by faith. That is to put our faith in him and God granting to us the precious gift of salvation only by His grace, not something that we could earn. So it's literally a gift, if you will, this perfect relief, uh, no more bondage to sin. And now, instead of anxiety, we pray. We pray. It's light and it's easy. So we pray. That doesn't mean that we're always going to get what we want because we're not going to get it. So this is the, this is the perspective of Christ being kind to us. Now I want to take a look, if you will, at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, um, and look at a command from the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look to verse 24. And it says here, and the servant of the Lord, who's that? That's you and me. <laughs> and the servant of the Lord. We can't talk about other people, they're not here. And the servant of the Lord must not. That's pretty strong language right there. A lot of people say, well, if you can't say something positive, don't say anything at all. We always need to be positive. Do not. Right? Is that positive? 
a negative way of putting, a truth that's required of us. It's a mandate. Uh, there's no choice that we have in this matter. It's strictly obedience the Lord desires. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Strive is quarreling and disputing and being contentious with others. Don't do that. You must not do that. That's not the way a believer should be. When you look at the requirements for for pastors and deacons, you see that same kind of responsibility. The leadership within the church should not be contentious and quarrelsome uh, to others and disputing. It shouldn't be known to do that. It says, but, well, here's the other side. So you must not do this, but here the but means, but you must do this. And what does it say? Be gentle. There's your word from Galatians 5.22. Uh, kindness, if you will, uh, to treat others gently, if you will, but be gentle because striving means you must not strive. Don't strive with others. Be kind means being kind to others. It doesn't matter if they're believers or unbelievers. Kindness is a grace and a virtue and a characteristic of every believer. Uh, and we need to use it well and consistently. So be gentle unto all men. And, and of course, all men includes everybody. And right after he says, be gentle with others, it says, and to teach. But it's a no, it says, apt to teach. Now, this is the servant of the Lord. So, apt to teach. Actually, uh, the word apt means skilled. Skilled in teaching. Skilled in teaching. It's a very important concept in the Scripture, but uh, here it's related to the grace of kindness. The be gentle unto all men, skillful to teach, and patient, and in meekness instructing those that oppose Him, that is, uh, the Lord, if God perhaps will give them repentance to the acknowledge and the truth. So if we're going to truly live a life of kindness... We're going to be kind to others, and we're going to lead them down the pathway where they can make a decision to put their faith in Christ, having the appropriate information to do that. In order to do that, we have to be skilled teachers. So you see it's sandwiched in there between being gentle to everybody, instructing in verse 24 those that oppose God, so that God might save them, if you will, give them repentance, so they might repent of their sins. So if we're going to be kind to others, uh, it means kind to those who are saved as well. It means kind to those who don't know the Lord. And those are the ones who need instruction to repentance, not the saved people. So obviously the injection of the skilled teaching, the apt to teach, applies to those who are outside uh, of the, the realm of salvation in this life, if you will. So we need to be skilled at teaching. So I do have to depart from here for just a second or two, over to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. Um, seems like I'll wear this passage of Scripture out, but there's a very important message here. So we're looking at kindness, and even though the kindness in 2 Timothy does not only apply from believers to unbelievers, it, also, it is part of the equation of our life and living out uh, and, and, and working out uh, if you will, our salvation, that is working out our life uh, to show the product of being saved, that is the graces of the Spirit, right? Um, or the characteristics of the Spirit. But how are we, how are we going to be skilled at teaching? We need to be skilled at teaching. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and these are the immature children of the Lord, um, because Hebrews is a book about spiritual maturity and the lack of it. So here's a great example of that, um, of that spiritual immaturity in believers found in this section 11 through 14. In Hebrews 5.11, of whom we have many things to say uh, and hard to be uttered, that is to be spoken, seeing, that means why, seeing you are dull of hearing. Dull is a word that in chapter 6 and verse 12 is rendered slothful. Same Greek word means slothful or sluggish is another word for that. In reality, it's spiritual lethargy. 
spiritual lethargy. We must be skilled at teaching. Uh, and as we, and I'm, I'm going to refer back to 2 Timothy where it says, the servants of the Lord must be skilled at teaching. Uh, here, uh, the, their problem of these immature um, uh, saints uh, that Paul address, Paul is assumed author, but he's, he's not, can't be dogmatic about that. We don't know who the author is in reality. Is claiming that these immature believers are slothful or sluggish in learning. They have spiritual lethargy, if you will, and uh, and that really means the the word um, the word uh, they are dull means slow, uh, slow to learn, slow to get it, if you will. Um, it's a slow response to biblical truth. So in verse 12, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, who ought to be teachers? The one who are dull of hearing. They should be teaching now, but they still have need of instruction. So if we're when the, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, but teach what? The first principles of the oracles of God. The elementary principles of salvation and the Christian life. The elementary principles. They're not even able to go on to say, go on to be able to to take in messages on the meat of God's Word, the strong meat, because they still don't have the basic principles down. I mean, if I'd have gone into a college uh, uh, analytical geometry and calculus class with just arithmetic in my background, I'd have never survived there. I had to have several other courses to get there. I had to have algebra, I had to have geometry, I had to have physics, and um, then I had to have advanced uh, algebra. And then in college, I could study this higher math. But without the preparation to get there, I wouldn't have been able to take it in. There are a lot of people who can't, can't grow spiritually on the strong meat of the word because they still don't have down the basic principles. They're not obedient to that and living that life out that is explained in the basic principles of life. And they certainly aren't able to teach others about it. To express that kindness that, Tim, that Paul said to Timothy in chapter uh, in Second Timothy, but it says in uh, in verse twelve, it says um, that teach you again the first principles um, of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You have need of milk. You still need the basic principles and to get those down before you can, on the building blocks of learning God's word, to go on to the deeper truths of God's word. So that's where a lot of people are. And, of course, what, what the author says here is you should be teaching now. But you're still stuck here at the basic elementary entry level. So in verse 13, for everyone that useth milk. And these were the immature believers that the author's addressing. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So that's why the skilled teaching is necessary for us to be good stewards and servants of the Lord. We've got to be skilled teachers. We've got to be able to explain it. Uh, you know, in Ezra and Nehemiah, when they addressed the, the, their audience in the streets there of Jerusalem, as they went to rebuild the city, they, they stopped and they, they, they took the Word of God and they read the Word of God. And they didn't just read it, they reasoned the Scriptures to the people. And that's why in Romans, the scripture says uh, in chapter 10 that how can we hear without a preacher? So God calls preachers. It's not because they have become something. It's because God made them something, called them to do that, enabled them to do it. And because of God's gifting them and preparing them and enabling them, they're teaching the word of God. And others must should be listening and learning and going on from the milk of the word to the strong meat of the word. But you can't get to the strong meat until you get the basic principles down. So everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. They're still a babe in Christ. But strong meat, that is the solid food of, of God's word, belongs to them that are of full age. That literally means spiritually mature, if you will. And they, they're wise with the wisdom of God that's given to them through their study of the Scriptures as God enables it. That they, um, Solid meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So our, we have our, our ability to know good and evil through the strong meat of God's Word. Now... 
and I'll say this, I'm, I said I can't talk about the people that aren't here, but I can, because there are people that aren't here, and, I, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to name names, but you got to wonder, but some people are not comfortable with studying the strong meat of the Word because they're still living on the basic principles. So to come to a Bible study where you're, you're just studying the Scripture, you don't have all the, you know, the ceremony of a morning service like we do on Sunday morning, uh, with the songs and the music and, and stuff like that, um, just to come and study the Bible, they don't see any use in it. They don't benefit from it because they don't envision that. But a real student of Scripture, which we all should be, want and hun- they hunger and thirst for the Word of God. They want to be where the Word is being taught. So that's an aside, if you will, to the comment over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. We need to be those teachers of the Word of God instructing others that they might repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ. So it's a kindness. And again, this is one example. We saw Christ's example of kindness to us. Uh, Come unto me, ye that are uh, heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And take your my yoke upon you. It's easy and it's light. And part of that is that's how Christ was kind to us. And our kindness, we can see, is being skilled at teaching uh, others and how that how that that can be very effective and very productive, but we miss that opportunity in our life. Uh, you know, Ephesians tells us that we need to be redeeming the time, and we literally need to be taking every opportunity in order to spread the word of God. But we can't spread it unless we know it. We have to be because it says in, in uh, Proverbs, "He that winneth souls is wise," and that wisdom is not because we're smart or intelligent. It's the wisdom that comes from God's Word that enables us. And when we have the opportunity that if we don't know what to say, God's going to enable us to say that because the Holy Spirit will direct us to the truth, guide us in the truth, so that we can make a a good and accurate and effective presentation of the gospel to other people. Um, And I I can't tell you how many times, and you probably have had, had the same testimony, you get in situations and somebody will ask a question, and it maybe is is something that you're not, you know, you can't just jump right on that with an answer. you got to think about that for a few moments. And as you do and reflect on an answer, think about your experience and your studies and the knowledge the Lord's given you. While you're doing that, the Holy Spirit's going to enable you to deal with that person and always be ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that is in us, if you will, to those who ask of us. So that's kindness to other people. And, of course, kindness extends to all kinds of different directions, just doing uh, things for people that just represent what we should be doing, the respect that's due them, if you will. And we're going to talk more about that in goodness, because kindness, the gentleness and the kindness is related to the goodness, gentleness and kindness is related to the next aspect uh, of our our spirit-led life, and that is goodness. That's what comes next in Galatians 5.22. So as we look back at that text, in Galatians 5, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's get to the right, right point here. Galatians 5:22 <clears throat> says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. We just dealt with goodness. What is goodness? Moral and spiritual excellence. That's what it is. That's goodness. Moral and spiritual excellence. <clears throat> so we, I, don't, I don't think that you can... And again, both of these relate to, and relate to our relationships to other people. It's hard to express kindness to someone and not express goodness. It's hard to express goodness and not express kindness. I think they really go hand in hand. So I believe they are uh, very much related... Um, in fact, I've heard some authors call goodness act of kindness. In other words, we have, kind, we have the, the kindness and the thought uh, kind, uh, to do things, but when we put that kindness into action, that becomes goodness, being good to other people. So that's just how some have expressed it. I'm not trying to say that I, mean, I can't be dogmatic about that, but certainly I can be dogmatic about the fact that they go hand in hand. There's no question about it. <clears throat> so a good example of this is found in Galatians 6 and verse 10. Don't have to go far for this example. 
Well, the scripture says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them who are of the household of faith. Wow. <laughs> as we have opportunity. Therefore, refers back to the teaching that is, precedes this, um, which certainly includes the aspect and the identification and the delineation of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and as we have, therefore, opportunity... What's opportunity? <laughs> we all know what it is. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you're, if you're, I'll give you an example. I was walking down the street um, years and years ago in Norfolk, Virginia. I was on business with Ford, and I was going to a doctor's office to, to have some, some work to do there. So I was going down the street, and on the way there, there were a couple of guys on the side of the street. And they sort of, you know, huffed up and puffed up and got their shoulders tall and all that kind of stuff and said, you got a quarter on you? Of course, back in that day, a quarter is all they asked for. Now it's, you know, a dollar or five dollars, right? They got a quarter on you? And I looked at these two guys, and it was not a very good neighborhood, very bad neighborhood. And I looked at these two guys, and, you know, and you don't know who's, who's real and who's not. And the, the thought came to me, they're just asking for a quarter is that really, is that really, <laughs> it, this is an opportunity. And it was, it was an opportunity. And I just looked at it as an opportunity instead of the fact that they might take my head off if I don't give it to them. <laughs> or they might have, I don't know. Knife in the pocket, who knows? So I did, I reached in my pocket, pulled out some change, gave them more than a quarter, but I just, it was an opportunity. But it was a small thing. I still remember it today because sometimes a small thing sort of stand out in your life. We're going to talk about that. Uh, in just a moment, but the thing is that we, as, as an example of what we should do, but this is a, these little kindnesses go somewhere and it's being good to people. So what we have here is says, do good, let us do good, let us a command in the scriptures. So whenever, so as we have opportunities, literally as, as opportunities present themselves to us, and they're not presenting themselves because God presents the opportunities to us. And then we need to determine, we need to determine what we're going to do with the opportunity. Number one, we should be more inclined to identify opportunities in our life, to know when an opportunity actually comes. It's not going to come as often if we're not looking for opportunities. It's really opportunities to serve the Lord. And serve the Lord doesn't mean we give money to people. Serving the Lord means that we're going to be kind to people and we're going to be good to people. Because as you there, it says... Uh, let us do good unto who? All men. All men. Similar, if you will, to the kindness that we talked about. We're going to be kind to all people. We're going to be good to all people. And as we have the opportunity, we're going to do that. And it says, especially them who are the household of faith. There should never, never be a qualm or an issue with being good to people who are like-minded in our faith in Christ. Um, so if you will, let's take a look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We looked at the example there. And um, I'll give you an aside though. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 27, um, we have a related passage over there. The scripture says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Now, that which is due, Proverbs 3.27. So, because that's the whole key here is, don't withhold good, do not. By the way, verse 28 says not. Verse 29 says not. Verse 30 says not. Verse 31 says not. That is, say not, devise not, strive not, envy not. Bunch of nots in there, right? And the first of this string is in verse 27, withhold not. It means don't do it. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> it's that simple. And the first of those is don't withhold good. Don't withhold good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Now, kindness in and of itself, as we've already read and pulled out of scriptures, is due to others. It's due as a servant of the Lord, we are to be kind to other people. Now, 
Uh, but it adds a, a responsibility here. It says, uh, it says, withhold not good from them to whom it is due. Well, what is owed? Because due is what's owed to somebody. Well, we're kind not because something is, is owed to somebody. We're kind because that's a characteristic of the believer who has an, a, the Holy Spirit indwelling them. We're going to be kind people. It's an enablement of the Holy Spirit, and it's uh, not only an enablement, but it's an inducement to action by the Holy Spirit. Now, but if, to those whom it's due. Well, um, if you rent an apartment from somebody, what's due them at the end of the month? Rent, <laughs> yeah, right? If you borrow money to pay for a car or a house, you owe that money back to the institution that loaned you the money, and that's due. So those are the things that are due, if you will. If you go to your neighbor and you say, can I borrow your snow shovel? Uh, it's a responsibility to take that back. So there are things that are due as well. And that's just a, a, a one particular aspect of kindness, if you will. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, look at verse 11. Now here's God's expectation regarding our kindness. Here's God's expectation. Now, before we do that, I want to go and look at chapter 1 to set the stage here. I don't want to pull this out of context at all, and it, re it requires going back and looking at it a little bit. So who are these people, the Thessalonians? As Paul addresses them in verse 3, he says, We are bound to, in chapter 1, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or fitting. It's fitting, because your faith groweth exceedingly. They had great faith. And the love of every one of you all toward each other abounds. Their faith is excellent. Their love is abounding. In verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith, that is faithfulness, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So they had much to be commended for. These are the people that Paul is addressing here. Um, so if we look over to verse 11 of chapter 2, um, having that stage set, it says, And for this cause, because of their calling, because of their responsible response to God, because of their faithfulness and their love and kindnesses to others, in verse 11, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Um, and I'm sorry, I was chapter 2. I want chapter 1, verse 11. It um, says, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. Now, keep in mind, this is said to the believers that are abounding in love, abounding in obedience to the Lord, and they're literally faithful in much, if you will, and their love is just exceedingly um, uh, vast towards each other. So in verse 11, he says, we pray uh, that our God would count you worthy of this calling. <coughs> and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. Even though we may be characterized in our own life like the Thessalonians were in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1, that's not enough. There's always more. We'll never get to the point in our life where we can, ah, you know what? I'm knocking it, and I'm knocking it out with love and patience and peace and all this stuff. Well, wait a minute, no. <laughs> that's, that's what our responsibility is. We're supposed to be good at that. Why? Because the one who works within us to, to enables us to manifest those characteristics, there's no limitations on his power and ability. So any lack of exceeding and abundant uh, manifestation of these characteristics, anything that's less than that, it means we're not doing what we should be doing. So, and we're, guess what? We're not perfect, so we're not going to manifest all of these perfectly. So, in verse 11, here's where the rubber meets the road, even for these people who were doing everything so well. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith and power. There you see goodness. And this is the goodness of God. It demonstrates his expectation for us that what? They would fulfill all the good pleasure of God's goodness 
and the work of faith with power. That power comes from the Holy Spirit. And verse 12 indicates why. The word that indicates why uh, Paul had directed this to the Thessalonians. is that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That the name of the Lord may be glorified in you. Remember, whatsoever things you do, do all for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. Uh, and Paul oftentimes used the analogy of a runner to the, to the believer that's, that's uh, working out their salvation in this lifetime. Uh, when I talk about working out salvation, it's not working for salvation. It's you're saved by the grace of God and there's work to do. And you're doing the work that God requires as a servant of the Lord already saved by His grace. So as we're, as we're demonstrating that power within us in our lifetime, uh, we should always be looking for that finish line, striving for the finish line. Because the finish line is that which Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. He says that the, the things of this world and all that we encounter in this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us in heaven. So whatever it is in, in this life, we're to keep our eye on the mark the prize of the high calling, which is really Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness in this life. And that's our goal, is to be like Christ. And everything we do should be pointing towards that. So there's never a point in time where we sort of stop and say, I'm close enough. <laughs> and what I think a lot of people, we would never say that, but I think sometimes our actions speak that to the Lord. Uh, where we... We don't, we don't have that same fire, that same burning desire, that same passion, enthusiasm, hunger and thirst for God's Word that we used to have. And it burns out a little bit. And we sort of, you know, there's a, a learning curve in the world that when you study a subject, your, your growth goes exponentially at first, and then it just sort of tapers off at the end and maybe decreases a little bit over a lifetime. But, you know, God expects our spiritual maturity to be steady. That's what He expects. There's nothing in the scriptures that tell us that it should ever taper off at any point in time. We should always be striving, striving for excellence uh, in all that we do for the Lord. And uh, these, these aspects, this gift of the Spirit that is demonstrated and manifested in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, the kindness, goodness, grace uh, of, of God, which, which allows us to love others and have the joy that passes understanding, a peace that passes understanding, is all an enablement and there's, and when we get older, God doesn't stop working in us. He continues to work on us and in us all the way through our lifetime. I remember a man that we went to, to see him. He had cancer, the church that I was saved in. And my wife and I, we looked at each other and said, let's go over and visit him. Um, because, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's you know, a faithful steward to the Lord we didn't know him most of his life. We'd only known him a couple of years. He was 75, 80 years old, eaten up with cancer. So we're going to be nice. We're going to go over there. We had, we had you know, fellowship with him, and, and, and I, he, I had instructed him. Uh, he had been a teacher in some places, but we were, we were working together for the Lord. And here he was in need, and uh, he's really on his deathbed. He didn't leave that bed um, uh, uh, from the time we went to visit till he died, and it was only a couple of weeks later but we went to be a blessing to him. Let's go and let's just bless him with a visit, read some scripture, just talk about it because we knew he'd be responsive. He was still talking and, and we just have a good time in the Lord. And we went and we left and what we found out is uh, he, we received the blessing. We don't know what he got, but we know we went looking to give one and we got it. You know, and it's that kind of thing that even in his deathbed, he was such a blessing to us to understand the condition that he was in. And he just blessed us with his patience, with his love. It was like, it was like he never had cancer. He just happened to be sitting in his easy chair one day. That's what it was like. It was just so amazing. And I still remember that visit like it was yesterday, but because it was such a blessing to us, such refreshing perspective on life. Because he truly understood the scriptures and he knew that when his time came that he was ready. And he was ready. He was ready to go. He wasn't anxious to go. He was ready to go. And as long as he had breath in this life, he was still going to glorify the Lord. Bring glory to the Lord. Which is what we're supposed to do. From the day we're saved to the day we pass from this life. 
We're to glorify the Lord in all that we do. And we do that through these works, if you will, or characteristics of the Spirit as they work out in our life. These excellencies, as many call them, to be manifested in us. And we just need to have a, an understanding that that's the expectation from God there in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, um, in verse 11 as we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. And I'm going to pause there for one second. Think about Moses. Mary and I had a long discussion about Moses today. About why he didn't enter the promised land. He wasn't allowed. You ever have that discussion? With others? Um, it was a good, healthy discussion. And, you know, Mary, Mary was saying, but all that he did, and he did such great things, and he, this one thing... Well, that's what we got to understand is we glorify the Lord until we die. And he stole the glory from the Lord when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it the second time. And I remember the, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, the time that it was slipped out of somebody's hand, it was going to hit the ground, and somebody reached in and grabbed it real quick, and everybody called him a hero because he, he came in and, and rescued the Ark. The guy died immediately because he wasn't allowed to touch the ark. Sometimes our human reasoning get in, gets in the way of glorifying the Lord. And we look at doing something, that's why we need to be so prepared with the Scripture and so Christ-like in our nature, if you will, so that we're responsive. We're responsive and reactive in a spiritual manner. Not, not because we think we can do things, but our life way too often is we're reactive in natural, uh, carnal ways. We need to be naturally reactive or spiritually reactive in spiritual ways. And so we, and according to verse uh, 12 there, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in all, in you and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we glorifying the Lord in all that we do? And if we're allowing these characteristics, uh, these virtues of God, that God has enabled through the power of the Holy Spirit in us to flow out of us if we're just, if we're allowing that. But what happens is we get into the situation where, uh, what it says in, in Proverbs 3.27, do not. Sometimes we do some things to quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, according to 1 Thessalonians, we quench the Spirit. And it says, there, don't quench the Spirit, don't do it. Sometimes you put that fire out. We're, all, we're in a life and it's like we sort of let the fire die or maybe we put it out some way. Don't let the fire extinguish. The, the burning power of the Holy Spirit within us should be alive all the way to the day we die. And that, that man on the, his deathbed that had cancer uh, was that. I don't lift him up. But that's what God can do through any of us when we're sold out to the Lord and we're living. He was so kind and good to us when we went to be kind and good to Him. It's amazing. That's what God can do through each of us if we just allow God to do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you will. Father, we're thankful for the study tonight. We're thankful for Your direction and guidance for the uh, indwelling Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us into the truth. Father, we're thankful for the enablement uh, to receive wisdom uh, from Your Word, Father knowing that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And we have a, a sincere, genuine, reverential fear of you, Father, knowing that our life is in your hands and you hold the very keys to life. And that's eternal life because you are eternal life. And so, Father, as we submit ourselves to you in our daily activities, may it be that we would fulfill this expectation that you have of us that in whatever things we do, we would bring you glory and bring you honor, living a life that's excellent in your eyes, Father, and not caring what the world thinks about how we live out our salvation through faith in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.